My name is Dr. Reem Hamiz Dakwar. I'm a full professor in communication sciences and disorders, and I am the director of neurophysiology and speech language pathology. My research is focused on Arabic diglossia, language development, language processing, and clinical uh, services in Arabic diglossia. Diglossia refers to the coexistence of two language varieties. Usually one is used for informal communication and acquired naturally, while the other is learned mostly formally and used for formal communication and reading and writing. There are two reasons, two main reasons for why I conducted my research. The first one relates to my experience as a speech language pathologist uh, working uh, with uh, children and adults in the Arabic speaking community. Uh, what I felt is that there was a gap in our knowledge that is critical for us to do our work in assessment and intervention for children and adults with communication disorders who are speakers of Arabic. I felt that I wasn't, there was something missing uh, while I was doing the work. The other part relates more to the fact that there is sparse research in relation to Arabic language development and Arabic language processing and communication sciences and disorders. And the few that are available, they have this tendency to present Arabic as just, you know, a situation where it's so different in a way that others cannot learn from it. So I wanted to decolonize the study and attempt to decolonize the study and bring a different alternative perspective to the study of Arabic language where others can see it as an interesting phenomena of study and that it's a phenomena that we can learn from not only about Arabs but also about ourselves, about the connection between language, brain and literacy. There's a lot of research that I'm involved in. Uh, one research is focused on aphasia recovery. So uh, aphasia is a language disorder that is um, uh, due to a brain damage, like a stroke. And what we know now in bilingual aphasia is that there are these cases where one language recovers uh, better than the other. For a long time, it was debated in the literature about why we see cases of which, you know, an Arabic English speaker would show better uh, recovery of English, their second language, compared to Arabic. Michel Paradis from McGill University brought an alternative explanation to this kind of non-parallel recovery that relates more to the fact that one language is acquired naturally and is more associated with implicit linguistic knowledge, where the other is more learned and is associated with explicit uh, linguistic knowledge. And what he suggested is that in cases of aphasia, the linguistic knowledge that we acquired naturally is more damaged and we more have access as uh, adults with aphasia to the explicit knowledge as a compensatory strategy. If this was true, then we can test it by focusing on Arabic diglossia, because in diglossia, you have one variety that is acquired naturally while the other is learned formally. And this is what we have done. We had to, one, adapt the bilingual aphasia test to test uh, equivalently two languages and to be able to compare the recovery of the two languages. So we had to first uh, adapt it to Palestinian Arabic and to Standard Arabic. And now we are uh, administering the test and we are finding these cases where the adults with aphasia are showing better recovery in specific items in the Standard Arabic. But now, we now know it's not a better recovery, it's just that they are two different systems and uh, the interaction between the brain damage and uh, the recovery is showing through these kind of differentiation. Similarly, we have a study that is focused on, adult, uh, on children with autism spectrum disorder. And uh, for a long time, uh, we had anecdotal evidence and uh, reports say, uh, maintaining that children with autism spectrum disorders are using standard Arabic. And for a long time, the interpretation was that it was just echolalia, meaning that they are just repeating what they heard and it's not really uh, meaningful and it's not serving a functional uh, communication. Uh, but it wasn't studied. So what we are doing now, we are uh, working in surveying the parents about language development while focusing on standard Arabic and the spoken Arabic. And we also already have samples of productions from children with ASD, and we're doing conversational analysis of when they switch to standard Arabic and showing that it is serving specific functional intentions and it is meaningful. I can go on, we're doing very much similar stuff with uh, stuttering, we're doing very similar work with language development. Uh, it is really that nobody was, it looks like so 
straightforward. What's really amazing is that nobody did that before. And I think it is because of the change of mindset where we're starting to see more appreciation of diglossia as a phenomenon to be able to start asking the questions that are relative to language development and processing. My research um, is supporting the development of academic and clinical resources that are critically needed for this developing profession and field in the Arab world and is also brings a different dimension on how to view Arabs and Arabic uh, related phenomena in a way that it's beyond othering them. It informs our theoretical questions, it informs our clinical practice. By learning about others, we're learning as much as about ourselves. We're learning a lot of information that is going to be helpful for us, not only to work with Arabs, but to work with any client. And I find my research informing my teaching, and the way I look at it, it serves three main goals. One it enables students to open their horizon and to be familiar with research that refers to diverse population and not that, it, that is not mainly Eurocentric. And that is very important because when they graduate, they're going to be expected to work with clients who are from diverse background. Uh, the second part is more uh, relating to critical thinking. By bringing the research that I'm doing, I'm enabling them to have an opportunity to think critically about the research and the literature that they are exposed to. The last thing, I also feel that uh, there's a growing group of students who are uh, students of color and bringing research that relates to communities that they're connected with also empowers them and makes them feel less marginalized in academia. And I do feel it in every interaction that I have with students of color in my class. And I open for them doors and try to my best to support them in developing their own research. I'm doing research with Dr. KD on language acquisition in Haitian American children. Um, I picked this topic because as a Haitian American myself, I found that there's very little research in our field on the topic. So my goal with my research is to look at how French and Creole interact with their production of English and how this plays a role with us as speech pathologists um, with treating individuals that come from this population. This research is important to me because I do come from this background and so as someone who comes from that background I feel like it's important for us to be represented in the field. Um, I would hate for my kids or someone who grew up just like me to be diagnosed with a disorder that's not really a disorder. Maybe it's something that plays more of a role with um, culture as opposed to being an actual disorder. So I think it's important for us in the field to be aware of what to expect from this population and how we can go about working with this population so that they pro they're provided with the best care. The research that I'm doing with Dr. KD is about heritage Arabic speakers um, and how the social pragmatic um, aspect comes into play with it. This research is important to the community because firstly there hasn't been a lot done on children. It's only been mostly on adults. Um, and it's also important to me because I grew up as a heritage Arabic speaker and I'm going to be working with these children in the future. So it's important to have the foundational knowledge needed to help um, treat and assess them. My research focuses on Caribbean Creole, specifically French Lexified Creole. And what I'm looking at in particular is diglossic situations that occur in Haiti versus bilingual situations that occur in St. Lucia. And I am trying to investigate whether or not some of the errors or patterns of communication that we see with aphasic speakers, if it really pertains to their individual linguistic patterns that are specific to their French lexification. There's a severe lack of knowledge on topics such as this or on special populations like this. In the academic world as well, there's a lack of academics who are familiar with this and who can contribute to the field. So I'm hoping that I'm able to contribute what I learned from my research to the new body of students so that they can then go out and teach it to new coming students as well. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to do research at Adelphi because um, the professors here and my advisors, they're so supportive and they allow you to do research on whatever you want to do. And we have all these great um, electives and things that allow for us to do research in the program, so I'm very grateful for that. 
there's a lot of uh, students, undergraduate and graduate students who are interested in diglossia and uh, they see it uh, exhibited in their community. And what I try to do is to bring my expertise and knowledge to support them so that they can develop their own research and they can be uh, adding to the knowledge that is so critically needed for them to be prepared to do the work for their own community in a sensitive and high quality uh, work that every person with communication disorders deserves.